machines interact like people, and bodies can be rebuilt from scratch. How will we wage war, fuel our need for power, commute to space? What technological leaps will most change the world in the next 50 years? Capturing the power of the sun, invisible soldiers, elevators to space. See how scientists today are making visions of tomorrow real. Physicist and futurist Michio Kaku will be your guide. The future is closer than you think. It all starts now with the world. 2057. The Earth faces a crisis. Fossil fuels millions of years in the making are finally running out. And other sources have not made up the shortfall. Across the globe, political conflict looms. Tethered 250 miles above the ocean is one of Earth's last hopes. An international research station. For five years, a team of 40 scientists has been trying to develop more efficient ways of capturing solar energy. But billions of dollars later, they've produced no breakthroughs. They have all been pulled from the station, except two, an American chemist and his Chinese colleague. Within weeks, they too will be sent home and the project abandoned. Shade. Morning, Bob. Morning, Michelle. Any good news? Not yet. Coffee? Perk you up? No, thanks. I've almost finished prepping another panel. Should be ready to go in a couple of minutes. Sounds good. I'll be there in a minute. Up next. First it was gasoline rationing. You give me now coffee with no coffee? I'm sorry, we've run out. Well, then order some more. I'm sorry, no more food orders. We have enough supplies until station shutdown. Great. In a last-ditch effort to find a solution to the energy crisis, the scientists are experimenting with ways to improve solar panels by altering their chemical composition. Solar technology has been around for decades, but it could be much more efficient. The test panels are coated with a new formula, then exposed to the sun in the hope that they can create a better, affordable solar panel. Harnessing solar energy is still considered too expensive, too inefficient to be a serious source of power. So why are scientists and oil companies spending millions of dollars investing in solar technology? Well, I'll tell you why. It's because sunlight is clean, it's safe, and oh yeah, it's also limitless. Now get your head around this fact. Every second of every day, the sun produces billions of times more energy than is consumed by the entire planet. The trick is catching it. TUV Rhineland in Cologne, Germany is the largest photovoltaic test center in the world. 70% of all solar panels are tested here for efficiency and durability. Most of the panels are made of silicon, an element that absorbs light and converts it to energy. But silicon panels have a drawback. Although sunlight contains a wide range of light, from ultraviolet to visible to infrared, silicon absorbs mainly infrared light. The rest of the sun's energy is lost as heat. Scientists at TUV have spent years testing other types of cells under the world's largest artificial sun. The standard efficiency for commercial panels is 14 to 18 percent. Some prototypes in early development could double that. But to compete with oil or coal, solar panels need an efficiency of 50 percent or more. Our best hope is to find a completely new material. And at the University of Utrecht in the Netherlands, Daniel van Malkoberg is trying to create one. In a vacuum chamber, 
He heats extremely conductive materials like cadmium and selenium to 570 degrees Fahrenheit. At this extreme heat, the molecules rearrange themselves into crystal lattices called nanocrystals. His solution contains tiny crystals so small, you could line up three million across your fingernail. But the most surprising transformation is visible only under ultraviolet light. The light absorbing properties of the nanocrystals have changed. Van Mockelberg and other researchers have created the holy grail of solar power. Substances that absorb light across the entire spectrum. Combined in a single solar cell, they would be nearly five times more efficient than today's solar panels. But there's a hitch. When scientists apply the tiny nanocrystals to a surface, it's difficult to arrange them in a regular pattern. But in order to have for who is on a cell, what we need for a good solar cell is an ordered hexagonal structure of these quantum dots with a strong interconnection between them and almost no defects so the energy can flow well. Researchers have spent years developing techniques to align the nanocrystals in a grid without defects. Van Mockelberg uses one of the most powerful microscopes in existence to visualize the result. This image, magnified 100 million times, shows they are close to creating a lattice of nanocrystals with few defects. The connections between the nanocrystals still need to be strengthened, but one day, we may have a solar panel that is 80% efficient in capturing solar energy. Oil rigs will be replaced by solar farms. And if you covered your roof with solar panels, you could power your home and still sell four times as much electricity back to the grid. On the space station, the latest test results are in. The scientists have high hopes for their new formula. With time and patience, the mulberry leaf becomes a silk gown. Confucius? Try again. German Mao. Chinese proverb. That was my next guess. I'm sorry. I'm patient, but we're running out of time on this. Let me take over. I'll clean the transmitter. Oh, uh, Paula should be here soon to check the photovoltaic generator. What about the new batch of test fluids we ordered? She's bringing them up. Finally, some good news. The fluids or Paula? station is about to receive a visitor by elevator. It sounds improbable, but NASA engineers are already designing one. Twenty fifty seven. The worldwide energy crisis is worsening on an international space station. Scientists are racing to create a more efficient solar panel. This is one of the last scheduled visits a technician will take to repair the space station. In three weeks, it will be shut down. Hello, Paula. How are you today? Fine. How about a little bit more air conditioning? Sorry, we're conserving energy. Great. What's our travel time? Two hours, 23 minutes. Get ready for takeoff. Ready when you are. Three, two, one. In the fairy tale Jack and the Beanstalk, 
a young boy climbs a beanstalk into the sky and reaches the clouds. Now, the 21st century version of this is called the space elevator. And oh yeah, it is physically possible. Now, amazing developments in nanotechnology may mean that in 50 years, a Sunday picnic in outer space may not be a fantasy. Dreaming the impossible is not new in the New Mexico desert. This is Los Alamos, birthplace of the atomic bomb. Now, physicist Brad Edwards dreams of riding an elevator into space. I started on a space elevator about seven, eight years ago when I saw a statement saying it couldn't be done. And for a physicist working on advanced concepts, that's red flag to a bull kind of thing. Edwards, a former designer of Los Alamos satellites, wants to make space travel cheap and safe. Rockets right now are exciting because there's danger, there's flame. We don't want that. We want it to be boring. So you get on, you're not thinking about whether you're going to die. You're thinking about, I'm going to go to space. I'm going to get there. When I get there, I'm going to do this. That's what we want. The idea of a space elevator is not new. But Edwards is the first to work out a practical design. A ribbon will extend 62,000 miles into space. A counterweight at the end will keep it taut through centrifugal force. An elevator car will climb 250 miles to a space station. By 2057, the trip could take just half an hour. It sounds crazy, but Edwards is already working out the nuts and bolts. He plans to anchor the ribbon on a former oil rig platform in the ocean. To minimize weather hazards, he's analyzed lightning data and found a quiet spot in the Pacific with few thunderstorms or hurricanes. And to lift the space elevator, a ground-based laser will beam high-intensity light at solar panels on the elevator car. Many challenges remain. What about orbital debris damaging the ribbon? Or radiation harming us in flight? Edwards believes that current technology can solve every problem except one. We need to make the high strength materials. Uh, we need to make those into a ribbon. Right now, um, steel's not strong enough. Kevlar's not strong enough. No material that we have is strong enough other than the carbon nanotubes. Los Alamos scientist Yun Tian Ju may have a solution. He's working with a remarkable new material that could be used for the space elevator's cable. It is 10 times lighter and 100 times stronger than steel. It's called a carbon nanotube. On a molecular level, it looks like a tubular honeycomb. It's made from the same material as coal and diamonds. The surface of this piece of carbon contains nanotubes. To see them, he uses a powerful scanning electron microscope. It took him just an hour to fabricate a nanotube. But it is so thin that to prove he had done it, took 12 hours and 230 photographs. Enlarged 50,000 times to the width of a hair, an image of a nanotube less than two inches long eventually circled the room. Now the challenge is to find a way to transform these tiny fragments into workable fibers. 